KOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel, John Russell, and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American History series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Friedel. The war in Ukraine is causing a rise in oil and wheat prices. Other items are hard to come by due to international restrictions on doing business with Russia. For example, many countries are seeing less fish than usual because Russia usually catches and sells a lot of fish. However, one item you may not think of that often is harder to find than normal. That is the crop growing aid known as fertilizer. Fertilizer is added to soil and provides plants such as wheat and corn with nutrients so they can grow. But some of the chemicals used to make fertilizer, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, require a lot of energy. As energy sources like gas, oil, and coal get more expensive, so does fertilizer. The Dutch bank, Rabobank, said 40% of the world's supply of potash, or potassium chloride, comes from Russia and Belarus. Potash is an important fertilizer ingredient, and it is not as available as usual. A company that follows fertilizer in London, CRU Group, said nitrogen-based fertilizer is four times more expensive than it was in 2020. Fertilizer made from phosphate and potash has gotten three times more expensive. As a result, farmers are more interested than before in using animal waste, sometimes called manure, as fertilizer. The animal waste has some of those nutrients and can be used by farmers to make their soil healthier. Farmers that raise livestock, such as cows and pigs, normally have to pay to get manure removed from their land. However, due to the high cost of fertilizer, people are paying the farmers to pick it up. Manure is absolutely a hot commodity, said Alan Kampschneider, a farming consultant. There are long lists of farmers waiting for manure deliveries. The need for manure is also helping people who make farm equipment that helps dry and spread manure. The spreaders are called honey wagons. Finite is a company based in North Carolina that makes manure dryers. The dryers take the water out of the waste and make it easier to spread. Finite said it has gotten calls for its equipment from farmers in Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. One company in Canada, Husky Farm Equipment, makes honey wagons. Some of them can cost $70,000. The company's president, Walter Gross, says they are sold out for six months. Other companies that make similar products said they are selling more than normal. Abe Sandquist says he has worked for much of his career to sell manure to farmers. Now he doesn't have enough. I wish we had more to sell, he said, but there's not enough to meet the demand. In the U.S., high fertilizer costs will likely cause farmers to plant fewer crops. 
The government notes the amount of wheat stored in the U.S. is at its lowest in 14 years. The manure will be able to replace some of the fertilizer, but it is not risk-free. First, there is not enough supply. Second, it is costly to transport. And third, there are environmental concerns about manure. Experts believe the manure can make water unhealthy. As a result, it is hard for farmers that raise pigs and cows to easily get into the manure business. Jim Munro is a spokesperson for a large company that raises pigs. He said more farmers are thinking about using manure to help grow crops. Dale Kramer is unsure about what he will do. He grows corn, soybeans, and wheat in the Midwestern U.S. state of Nebraska. He has been trying to get manure for his 2,400 hectares of land. So far, he has not found any. Camp Schneider said manure prices are almost 100% higher than usual. Pat Reisinger is a farmer in Iowa. He said he is glad he raises animals because he can use their manure for his corn and soybeans. He is also able to sell a little to his neighbors. Reisinger, however, is unique. In recent years, farms like his are less common. Instead, certain regions in the U.S. are known for producing items like eggs, milk, and meat. That is where the most manure can be found. However, some of those regions are far away from the areas that need the animal waste. As a result, some parts of the U.S. have too much manure, and others do not have enough. Brett Reinford of Pennsylvania raises cows that produce milk. Last year, he told other farmers they could take his manure. No one wanted it. Now he has something valuable. I wish we had more, he said. I'm Dan Friedel. Researchers in Japan have developed a robot capable of peeling a banana without crushing the fruit inside. While the two-armed machine is only successful 57% of the time, banana peeling points to a future where machines could do more sensitive, skillful kinds of work. Video from researchers at the University of Tokyo showed the robot pick up and peel a banana with both hands in about three minutes. Researchers Hicho Kim, Yoshiyuki Omura, and Yatsuo Kuniyoshi trained the robot using a deep imitation learning process. In this training, they showed the banana peeling action hundreds of times to the robot to produce enough data for the robot to learn the actions and copy them. In this case, the banana reached its success rate after more than 13 hours of training. While the experiment requires more testing, Kuniyoshi believes his method can teach robots to do different simple human tasks. He hopes the better trained robots can help with Japan's labor shortage problems, particularly in food processing factories that currently depend on human workers. I'm John Russell. A scientific team is headed to Tonga to measure the effects of January's 
undersea volcano explosion on the surrounding ocean. As part of the project, the team will use a robotic boat to help create a detailed map of the sea floor. The explosion or eruption of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haapai volcano was among the world's largest in the past thirty years. The eruption on the South Pacific island nation sent smoke and gas shooting thirty kilometers into the air. It also created ocean waves called tsunamis that formed across the Pacific Ocean. Some of the waves were up to fifteen meters high. Reuters news agency reported. The eruption and tsunamis led to at least three deaths in Tonga, and destroyed numerous homes as well as communications equipment. Tonga's government said the effects of the explosion were felt as far away as South America. The team going to Tonga will use sound and video equipment and other scientific instruments to examine the undersea effects of the explosion. The project is a joint effort between New Zealand's National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, or NIWA, and Japan's non-profit Nippon Foundation. The scientists will be surveying thousands of square kilometers of the sea floor and collecting video images of the eruption's effects," said a recent press release by Niwa. The leader of the project is Mike Williams, the chief ocean scientist for Niwa. He predicts the team will find widespread changes to the ocean floor and sea life in areas around Tonga. Before the eruption, much of the volcano was above water, but now none of it is, and the neighboring islands of Hunga Tonga and Hunga Haapai were reduced in size. Williams said. He added that the team expects to find similarly dramatic changes when mapping underwater areas. Williams said the damage to undersea communication lines suggests the effects of the eruption stretched up to fifty kilometers from the volcano's center. This means the explosion likely affected ocean life in an area of at least eight thousand square kilometers. The scientists will gather underwater sound data from devices known as echo sounders. The equipment is designed to map the shape and structure of the underwater landscape, Niwa said. In an online video published on Facebook, Williams said the scientists will also deploy a video system that will survey wide areas of the seabed. This should help the team see how debris from the volcano has affected sea life in the area. The team will travel to Tonga aboard a Niwa research ship, and spend a little over two weeks in the area. The researchers will also use a robotic boat to collect environmental data and carry out detailed mapping operations of affected areas. The boat, called Max Limer, will be guided by controllers in Britain. The controllers are with Seakit International, the British company that built it. The Max Limer is set to keep surveying the area for up to thirty days. Ben Simpson is the head of Seakit International. He said in a statement, "The Tonga mapping operation is a good project." 
to demonstrate the benefits of using robotic surveying equipment in the ocean. Simpson noted that the Max Limer needs no crew and uses less than 2% of the fuel needed for most research ships. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. Today we continue the story of America's 36th president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson was vice president to John F. Kennedy. Kennedy was murdered in Dallas in November of 1963. Johnson served the last 14 months of the president's term. Then he won a full term of his own starting in January 1965. Most of Johnson's time and energy would be taken up by the war in Vietnam. By early 1964, America had about 17,000 troops in Vietnam. The troops were there to advise and train the South Vietnamese military. Vietnam had gained its independence from France in 1954. The country was divided into North and South. The North had a communist government led by Ho Chi Minh. The South had an anti-communist government led by No Din Jin. In 1957, communist rebels, the Viet Cong, launched a violent campaign in the South. They were supported by the government of North Vietnam and later by North Vietnamese troops. Their goal was to overthrow the government in the South. President Johnson believed that the United States had to support South Vietnam. Many Americans agreed. They believed that without American help, South Vietnam would become communist. There were concerns about the so-called domino theory, that if South Vietnam fell, other Southeast Asian countries would also fall to communists. As Johnson began his full term, his military advisors told him the communists were losing the war. They told him that North Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong forces would soon stop fighting. On February 6, 1965, however, the Viet Cong attacked American camps at Pleiku and Kinon. The Johnson administration immediately ordered airstrikes against military targets in the North. Some observers in the United States questioned the administration's policy. James Reston of the New York Times, for example, said President Johnson was carrying out an undeclared war in Vietnam. In March 1965, the first American combat troops arrived in South Vietnam. Congress supported the president's actions at that time. However, the number of Americans who opposed the war began to grow. These people said it was a civil war. They said the United States had no right or reason to intervene. For six days in May, the United States halted bombing of North Vietnam. The administration hoped this would help get the North Vietnamese government to begin negotiations. The North refused, and the United States began to build up its forces in the South. By July, 125,000 Americans were fighting in Vietnam. 
some Americans became angry. Anti-war demonstrations took place in San Francisco and Chicago. More and more students began to protest. They wanted the war to end quickly. Some people thought the anti-war demonstrations were only delaying peace in Vietnam. James Reston believed the demonstrations would make Ho Chi Minh think America did not support its troops. And that, he said, would only make him continue the war. In December of 1965, the United States again halted its air campaign against North Vietnam. Again, it invited the North Vietnamese government to negotiate an end to the fighting. And again, the North refused. Ho Chi Minh's conditions for peace were firm. He demanded an end to the bombing and a complete American withdrawal. Withdrawal would mean defeat for the South. It would mean that all of Vietnam would become communist. President Johnson would not accept these terms, so he offered his own proposals. The most important was an immediate ceasefire. Neither side would compromise, however, and the fighting went on. In 1966, President Johnson renewed the bombing in North Vietnam. He also increased the number of American troops in South Vietnam. Nineteen sixty six was also a year for congressional elections. The opposition Republican Party generally supported the war efforts of Lyndon Johnson, who was a Democrat but it criticized him and other Democrats for economic problems connected to the war. The war cost $2 billion every month. The price of many goods in the United States began to rise. The value of the dollar began to drop. Americans faced inflation and then a recession. To answer the criticism, Administration officials said progress was being made in Vietnam, but some Americans began to suspect that the government was not telling the truth about the war. Opposition to the war led to bigger and bigger demonstrations. In July 1967, just over half the people questioned for opinion surveys said they did not approve of the president's policies. But most Americans believed that Johnson would run again for president the next year. Johnson strongly defended the use of American troops in Vietnam. In a speech to a group of lawmakers, he said, Since World War II, this nation has met and has mastered many challenges. Challenges in Greece and Turkey, in Berlin, in Korea, in Cuba. We met them because brave men were willing to risk their lives for their nation's security. And braver men have never lived than those who carry our colors in Vietnam at this very hour. The price of these efforts, of course, has been heavy. But the price of not having made them at all, not having seen them through, in my judgment, would have been vastly greater. Then came Tet, the Vietnamese Lunar New Year, in January 1968. The communists launched a major military campaign. They attacked 31 of the 44 provinces of South Vietnam. They also struck at the American embassy in the capital, Saigon. Military police got back into the compound of the $2.5 million embassy complex at dawn. 
Before that, a platoon of Viet Cong were in control. The communist raiders never got into the main chancery building. A handful of Marines had it locked and kept them out. But the raiders were everywhere else. CBS News reporter George Sievertson described more of the fighting in Saigon and how it affected civilians in a poor part of the city. This neighborhood is called the chessboard because of the maze of alleys and passageways. Its residents are mostly poor working people, and its slums are a refuge for Saigon's hoodlum and criminal elements. Vietnamese rangers and marines move carefully, blasting buildings and possible Viet Cong hiding places before moving ahead. This was the first time heavy fighting has taken place in Saigon proper. Until now, most of it has been in the Chinese section of Cholon and in the suburbs. The VC were difficult to dislodge. They obviously knew the section well and had built barricades in key spots. The Rangers and Marines took casualties, mostly from hidden snipers. As soon as a section had been cleared, more terror-stricken civilians scurried out of their homes. Thousands of them fleeing from the bullets and explosives, and even more dangerous, a fire that began to rage out of control. Residents in nearby buildings began dragging their most precious possessions out of their shops and homes. Saigon's water supply system is operating only at 70% of normal, so fires are a serious menace. For these people, many of them who fled the war from outlying villages, this is the cruelest blow. The curfew has kept them from making a living. Food prices have tripled since the fighting began a week ago. And now, their homes are being destroyed. Thousands of people were killed in the Tet Offensive. The communists suffered heavier losses than the South Vietnamese or the Americans. But many Americans were surprised that the communists could launch such a major attack against South Vietnam. For several years, they had been told that communist forces were small and losing badly. General William Westmoreland, commander of U.S. military operations in Vietnam, spoke with reporter George Sievertson. General, how would you uh, assess yesterday's activities and today's? What is the enemy doing? Are these major attacks? Or... The enemy very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to create maximum consternation uh, within uh, South Vietnam, uh, particularly in the populated areas. Now, yesterday, the enemy exposed himself by virtue of this strategy, and he suffered great casualties. As a result of the offensive, popular support for the administration fell even more. Democrats who opposed President Johnson seized this chance. Several ran against him for the party's nomination in 1968. These included Senator Robert Kennedy of New York and Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota. Kennedy and McCarthy did well in the early primary elections. Johnson did poorly. At the end of March 1968, the president spoke to the American people. He discussed his proposal to end American bombing of North Vietnam. He talked about his appointment of a special ambassador to start peace negotiations. And he announced his decision about his own future. I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office the presidency of your country. Accordingly, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Another major issue facing America in the 1960s was the civil rights movement, which sought to ensure equal rights for black Americans. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.